There are some who believe that the Holy Spirit just shows up at the end, but I would contend that the Holy Spirit shows up in the beginning. Uh, uh, your pastor, according to the history that is found in your church bulletin this morning, your pastor made a profound quote last week. Uh, I don't have it here, but it says something like God uh, prepares even before. He, re he writes the history before it happens. Yeah. And so it, it is important for us to understand the history so that we can delve deep and appreciate the richness that the Holy Spirit gives us. So let's start with Acts chapter 2, two verses, and then we're going to leave there. As you go to Acts chapter 2, I would ask you that if you have pen or pencil, use it because you might want to take some notes. I also will say to you, today I'm going to introduce to you a few scriptures so that we can understand this history. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will isolate ourselves inside of one text. I only say that because it is normally not my custom to throw out a lot of scriptures. I like to stay in one place. But today, we're going to stay with two. We're going to try to remember two in our hand up here. But then we're going to deal with a few other scriptures over here so that you understand chapter two, if that's all right with you. Of course it is. And so, Acts chapter two, verses one and two. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And so if you don't mind, let's stop for just a moment for just a very quick word study along the way that will help us as we move forward. The Greek word is simply reo, simply reo. And uh, this word is what we've translated here as fully come, fully come, made up of two Greek words. There is a, a, a three letters to begin this word. Uh, in English, that would be C-Y-N, uh, in, or S-Y-N. In Greek, it would be uh, sigma Upsilon and Nu. When we think about this word or, or this prefix, sin, you've heard it before. You've heard it in the word syntax. Syntax means the relationship of words. Syntax, the relationship of words. You've heard it in the word symphony, the relationship of sounds. When you hear a symphony, it's difficult to decide which instrument is playing which note. If, if a symphony is playing, then that means everything comes together in such a harmonious way that you cannot separate the audio that you hear in your ear. A symphony. There are other words in the Greek that give us this whole idea of relationship. As a matter of fact, when he begins, John chapter 14, he says that, you know, uh, uh, be not afraid, right. believe in God, believe also in me. He goes on to say, in my Father's house there are many masters. This is a revival, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, to, to revive, let me go back and say this. To revive means that you started somewhere, yeah. and now we're trying to get back there. Oh, my okay? My so I'm hoping that I got some Bible scholars in here. Yeah. He says that in my Father's house are many mansions. Uh -huh. In the Greek, this really says that there are rooms, that these rooms are related to each other. They're close. And it uses the word maybe that we call in English if we were to kind of move it around a little bit, it would be like mono. You know, to bring yeah. one to another, yeah. one to another. Yeah. That's close, but not close enough. Yeah. What I mean is that in this church, there is an office, yeah. there are some bathrooms, yeah. there is a fellowship hall, yeah. and all of the rooms are closed, yeah. but they're not the same. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They're close, uh -huh. but they're not so close that you cannot distinguish them. Yeah. Uh, look at your neighbor. Yeah. Uh, now, that person is close to you, but you can still notice that that person is not you. Yeah. Uh, there's another word in, in Greek. Uh, para, as in paraclete, yes, which we're yes, talking yes. about the Holy Spirit. Yes. Again, para is close, it's near, 
Yeah. It's in proximity, yeah. but it's not like sin. It's sin for me. Let's think about it. Let's think about that. It's one thing to be close. It's another thing to be in such companionship that you cannot tell one from the other. So there are times when we're close, there are times when we're in proximity, but then there are times when something is so close that you cannot tell the difference. And so in the day of Pentecost, when it fully came, then you could not tell the difference difference yeah. between the saints of God. They were on one yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, we're there. Are we together? Yeah. Okay, so when we think about this Pentecost, uh -huh. the text tells us that it fully comes. Yeah. So therefore, that means that there must have been a season yeah. before it fully came. Yeah. Yeah. Is that alright? It's got to be a season. If it fully came, uh -huh. then there was a season when it wasn't all the way there. Oh, come on, talk to me. So somebody here has to be in a season in their life where you're thinking that you really want God to do something in your life, and you're not all the way there. Right. Uh oh, maybe I'm in the wrong church. Maybe you're all the way there. But at least maybe you can admit that you can remember a time before you got there. And so this, this relationship with the Holy Spirit is, in fact, a process. Uh -huh. It's a process. Yeah. The Holy Spirit fully came. So I want to kind of give us some history here so that we can understand. Can I take you back for a moment? Uh -huh. When I was growing up, there was a familiar scripture that we read every single Sunday in church. It was Psalm 1. Uh -huh. We read all of Psalm 1 every Sunday. And finally you get to verse 4, whereby it says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Yes. Yeah. Never understood that as a kid. I kept trying to figure out what was a shaft and what was the wind doing and so on and so forth. And my Sunday school teacher said it was tumbleweed. I uh -huh. tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Some Sunday school teachers need to go back to BTU. <laughs> this whole idea of, of the wind driving the shaft away is very fundamental to us understanding the power, the presence, and the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But because what this text is really talking about is it is talking about, if you will, think about a stalk of wheat. Yeah. And if you had a, a bundle of wheat, you would realize that there would be a part to it, but you would not actually be looking to at the actual wheat that you could make bread out of. Uh -huh. So it would have to be processed in order for us to get to the usable part that we could uh, use for wheat. This text is talking about that process and the breakdown of that. We call it winnowing, and that means yeah. that you're taking the grain and you're putting it uh, in, 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 the, in the African world and in, in the, the, the uh, Eastern world. Oftentimes they would have these big baskets that you can still find in African markets today, big woven baskets. Yeah. And they would place in there the grain and they would go up on the mountain or they would go up in a structure that was up high where there was wind blowing and they would take that basket and they would toss yeah, yeah, those yeah. grains into the air and the air would take away the shaft yeah. in order to release the part that you need to make something. Yeah. Okay, so now you got that little part. We're going to get back there again. I'll say that about three times so we get it. Because I want us to go back a little bit further and understand this more. Yeah. We often talk about Satan as a divider. Uh -huh. matter of fact, matter of fact uh, he said to Peter, he said to Peter that Satan desires, in Luke 22, verse 31, he said that Satan desires to sift you as weak. But, but, but you know what? As, as, as an immature Christian, that made me think that because of Satan's desire, that all division was bad. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, somehow or another, I confused it and thought because it was something that Satan wanted, yeah. that it must be bad. Yeah. But, but the fact is that, that, that just because Satan wants it doesn't mean that it's bad. Right. But because Satan can take something and use it for the wrong reason yeah. that God uses it for the right. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Just trying to say this right here: that Satan has the job to imitate God. Uh -huh. He ain't always going to yeah. imitate God. Yeah. Now, don't you be 
people. Satan imitates God. Yeah. So just because something happens that seems either godly or not godly, right. when Satan is in control, no matter what it is, it's a bad thing. Yeah. Satan wants to act like God, yeah. and so therefore he has the desire to sift you yeah. as we. Yeah. But in fact, God is a great divider and separator. I'm going to show you what I mean by that in a moment. But I just want to talk about that one thing that, can I say just one more thing, because I know we're in church, we don't want to talk about the devil too much, but let me just say one more thing about that. If I might paint a picture for you for just a moment, I want you to think about a bowl. Uh -huh. Think about a bowl. Nice glass bowl, wooden bowl, whatever kind of bowl you want. Now I want you to think about that bowl full of apples. Uh -huh. So just think about it. Now you're, you're thinking about your dining room table or whatever table, and on that table there's a bowl, and in that bowl there are plenty of apples. It is a bowl full of apples. Yeah. Can I talk about shopping for a moment? Uh -huh. I am not always so excited about a shouting church. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, don't get quiet. <laughs> excited about a shouting church. Uh -huh. I've watched church whereby folk jumped up and ran down the center aisle and ran all around the room and they jumped over pews and all of that kind of thing. <laughs> Sometimes that's not worship, that's exercise. <laughs> Divided darkness and light. Right. 
Remember, he divided the, the, the waters yeah. from the land, right? Am I, am I getting somewhere? Yeah. And he, he was dividing some stuff, right? And so then finally he creates man. And once he creates man, he gives man one dietary law. He gives him one dietary law. Can I say something like that? You know, part of our problem as Americans is we put the wrong stuff in our mouth. And we don't have any, any temperance over what we put in our mouth. That's why we're so unhealthy. You know, can I be quiet? Sometimes the reason that we can't work for God is because we're unhealthy. We have to be careful in terms of what we put in our mouth. And God is concerned about what you eat. From the very first law, the very first thing that he warned us against is eating everything. Some of us are sick, some of us are sad, some of us are depressed. Because practically we eat the wrong stuff. We don't drink any water. This is you ever heard of prosperity ministry? I'm preaching prosperity right now. Because that's wealth. Your body is strong when you feed it and you give it the right stuff. And so God is concerned about what we eat. And do you know that if we had some temperance over what we ate, perhaps the practice of being concerned about what we put in our mouth would help us be more concerned about other things we do with our body. You'll get that when you get home. <laughs> Let me show you what he does here. If you look at 217, 2 verse 17, it says, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now that's an interesting kind of tree, isn't it? Because it has two diametric kinds of things here. Good and evil. Well, I guess you know the story, right? All of us have inside of us Something that needs to be separated. All right. All right. All right. Separated. All right. All right. Separated. You, you don't believe me, okay? Right. Let me show you. Let me show you. I just, I, I'm gonna, because you're smart people, I'm just gonna give you a list of some separation. Adam was, and I know people, they say that Jesus was the only begotten son of God. That's true. He is the only begotten son, but he's not the only son. Okay? Not the only son. Luke chapter 3 verse 38 tells us that Adam was in fact the son of God. The difference between Adam and Jesus is that Adam is created and Jesus is born. But they're both his sons. That Adam is the son of God created. Christ is the son of God born. Both his sons. Are you ready for the pattern? The first son, as you know, messed up. And the second son had to fix him. Remember Cain and Abel? First son, messed up. Second son had to fix up. You should remember a man named Abraham had two sons, one named Ishmael and one named Isaac. One was the son that was not of promise. One was the son that had to be carried away. And the other son was the son with the promise. Anybody, anybody All right. All right. You, you remember Isaac? Uh, he had two sons. Right. One name was Esau, the other name was Jacob. You remember Esau, the oldest born, the first born? He messed up, and so the second son came, and the promise was not in there. You remember this boy now, Jacob? And Jacob had two sets of sons. The first set messed up, and the second one had to come and redeem the nation. You remember that? Do you remember a nation called Israel that had to be divided into pieces? Do you realize that there's something going on here in terms of the pattern that God has? There is the first and the second. Uh -huh. I would submit to you that by the end of the week, I'd like for you to recognize that the person that you were born is not acceptable. Uh -huh. That there's the first you, and then there needs to be a reborn and second you who comes back in order to do what God has called you to do. Uh -huh. This separation is important.
on this process. And so back to my back to my childhood. All right, all right. It says in this text, he says that uh, you know it's like the shaft which the wind driveth away. And so if I might call David, let's let's see this, and we're, we're going to pull this all together because you're probably saying, but now, well, he's told us a lot, but he hadn't told us. I'm going to give you the punchline at the end. <laughs> Second Chronicles chapter 21, I'm just trying to set this division up. I want you to see it. I want you to see that we have to have some things separated in order to really truly understand and embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. And so here in First Chronicles chapter 21, we find David in verse 17. It's a long story. I can make it short for you. Basically, David sinned by counting the people. And by verse 17, we find David, and he's talking to God, and he said, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let them hand, let thy hand, I pray, thee, O Lord, my God, be on me and my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. And so what happens is David is pleading with God because David sinned and the people are going to have to suffer behind it. It, it, Just parenthetically, I quickly say, be careful where you go. Yeah. Yeah. But, but don't get mad here, shallow, and leave a good leader and go to some leader that's going to curse your house. Yeah. People think they stand on their own. No, we are a community. Right. So you got to ask Moses when he came through the Red Sea, when he came through, they came through as a family. Yeah. This is not about you. This is about us. Yeah. But when we come to church and we have a leader and we have leaders, it is not about you. It is about us. And so therefore, everybody suffers or everybody is blessed. Yeah. And so here David is pleading with God and basically God says no. And in verse 18, he says, you know, you're going to have to stay together. And so in verse 18, the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David and David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor yeah. of Ornan yeah. the Jebusite. Uh -huh. Okay, and so the Lord basically says, I'm going to show faith to people right. and put a altar on this threshing floor. So let me help you. A threshing floor, as I said to you earlier, uh, they would take the grain and they would toss it into the air so that the wind could pass by and take away the outer hole. Now we're talking about that book that I know everybody is reading because I know you're all reading as pastors ask you to read Watchmen Nee and you've been reading that. And so we talk about the breaking of the outer man. What God was telling David to do is to go to the threshing floor. The threshing floor was a place where they separated the good part from the unusable. Yeah. Right. They, they separated the wheat there so that they could end up with something that they could use in order to make bread. Yeah. And so a separation had to take place on the threshing floor. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. God tells him to build an altar on this threshing floor. David goes, he buys it from one of the Jebusite. I, I wish I had time to preach that sermon. But the fact is, he, he paid full price. The Jebusite said, I'll give it to you. But David said, no, i got to pay for this. And don't you know that in our lives, when something is worthwhile, we need to pay for it? Yeah. And so he pays for it. He builds this altar there. He prays to God, and God shows faith. That's right. So now he's built this altar in a place where they used to separate wheat. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, are you ready for this? Yeah. By the time we get to Chronicles chapter 3, the Bible tells us that Solomon, because David didn't end up building the temple, but Solomon did. Uh -huh. And so by the time we get to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, it says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord yeah. at Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of one of the Jebusite. You see it? Yeah. In the same place where they had been separating wheat, the same place where David had messed up and built the altar, and in the same place where David connected with God, the same place where God, where David asked God to allow him to separate himself from the situation and the sin, the same place Solomon came and built the temple. Yeah. Okay, right. can we get back to my symphony now? All right. All right. All right. Is it okay to have a symphony in the sanctuary? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, 
it okay to understand that it seems that there is a pattern of foot here in the text? And if I had time, I could probably present you with at least 15 to 25 more instances whereby there is this duality where there's something that is unusable and something that's usable. And God wants to get to the usable if you would just present yourself in the place where God can work on you. So I've said all of this to say that we all need to connect with this question for and allow it to become temple. A place where God dwells is a place where we can have room for anything else. Remember I said that on that day of Pentecost when it had fully carried, when something fully comes, as I'm saying to you, when it's connected so close, and when it comes to everything it ought to be, when it fills you up, there's no room for anything else. And so here we are. Can we talk about the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit comes as a wind. Threshing floor up high on a mountain. Yeah. Comes as a wind. Threshing floor. Heights up. Yeah. Yeah. Say heights. Yeah. Heights up the windows. Uh -huh. And let the wind blow through. Yeah. And when the wind blows through, it separates that which is unusable. Yeah. And it leaves that which can be used. Yeah. And so finally you get to the day of Pentecost through a process. Uh -huh. Now I've cut the process short because I could go back and tell you that the devil wants your seed. Yeah. He wants to catch you before you ever get to the threshing floor. If you read uh, over there in the book of Revelation chapter 12 and 13, you'll see that the dragon, the beast, is trying to get the woman's seed. Because you realize the seed type of house will always be. And you got to bury the seed and allow transformation to come. And once you get the seed, you got wheat. You take it to the threshing floor and you take it through what a process. There is a process before the Holy Spirit fully comes before. The work can be done. There has to be a process. Sometimes you might be buried like a seed. Sometimes you might feel like you're underwater because seed got to be watered. But then there's a breaking forth. And once you break forth, then something comes out of sprout, a spring, and then it grows up and then you take it to the threshing floor. It's still not usable. Somebody just glad they got out the dirt and they think they're ready. But I tell you, you still got to make it to the threshing floor because there's more separation to be done. Yeah, baby, you green, and yeah, you run out the mud, and yeah, you run out the dirt, but there's still a process that needs to be done in your life. Yes, amen. Come on. Yes, sir. So before you go to sleep on me, because I can really talk about this all day, we, we've got to go through the process. We must be separated from that which is unusable. Yeah. Uh, when we get to the New Testament, I mean, I see Jesus right now in this very season that we're celebrating now as we talk about the, the, the Passover and the Pentecost. I recognize that Jesus, even when he got ready to wash their feet, the Bible says that he took off his outer garment. And then he took it and put it back on. Carried it to the place just before the cross and then they took his clothes again. Uh -huh. I wish you could see it. Uh -huh. yeah. Maybe you can't see it. Let me tell you about a man. His name is uh, Joseph. Uh -huh. Joseph found himself uh, with a woman that wanted to take advantage of him. And so when he left, she took his coat. Uh -huh. Joseph had some, some, some history with coat taking because his brothers took, took his coat. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus comes to a man who's begging, blind Bartimaeus, and the first thing he did before he went to Jesus, he took off his outer coat. Yeah. Uh -huh. Jesus takes off his coat to become humble to wash feet. Yeah. He then gives up his coat in order to go on the cross. Yeah. All of us have something on the outside that needs to be taken off in order for God to see us. Let's go on. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 and we can go home. Because I, I know you see this now. So, for the next three days, we're going to talk about how 